Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, okay, so I'm very pleased to be here at this uh, 2012 uh, PhD uh, Microsoft Research Cambridge Summer School. And I'll try to uh, tell a little bit about what we do in the organization where I belong to, Microsoft Research Connections, and a little bit of my background, you know, and it's right, as uh, it was said in my introduction, yeah, today is a great day for my uh, former organization, the European Center for Particle Physics. So after more than 30 years of work and after 40 years of uh, the uh, Higgs theory, first announced by Professor Higgs in Edinburgh. Well, we have uh, all the reason to believe that the Higgs uh, particles are there, where more or less where they're expected to be at under 25 GeV of um, mass, of energy of mass. And uh, yeah, I mean, um, so today, I mean, early in the morning there was uh, uh, major announcement uh, at CERN and uh, well I mean uh, it's a big accomplishment and you know I feel still very very excited so and that is not just the uh, it's only the beginning I mean you know now there are many many years of physics research to be uh, to be done based on that so yeah so that basically cover what uh, I wanted to say for the people who don't know me so while uh, I was at CERN for many years I was in charge of uh, developing uh, uh, an international computing infrastructure because you know CERN is an international organization and both the, uh, the data are produced internationally and so the analysis of the data. So CERN is very much a good fit for uh, you know what we are going to discuss later on uh, in this hour about you know the importance and the relevance of cloud computing for, uh, for, uh, for science. So, you know, so while, uh, while at CERN I was developing all those infrastructure, which eventually uh, was also used by many other uh, scientists in Europe. And, um, you know, my major accomplishment before I joined Microsoft in 2005 was the EGE, which was basically the uh, computing infrastructure that has been used, uh, you know, for the, for the X discovery. So I, you know, I feel a little bit part of the uh, enterprise still, and that is really very fulfilling. And, uh, you know, uh, my recent uh, accomplishment in Microsoft was, uh, you know, to move from uh, uh, the distributed computing model available at that time in the early 2000s, grid computing, to uh, cloud computing, which was we've been doing Venus here and going to, uh, to speak about it. Now, I was asked to also say a few words about the organization uh, to which, you know, myself and Scarlett and a number of other people in Kenji uh, belong. So we are part of Microservices Connection, which is uh, an organization headquartered in, uh, in Redmond, part of Microsoft Research, and in a way is the, uh, is the outside phase of Microsoft Research. So Microsoft Research essentially is involved in Intramura, you know, internal research, and uh, we used to be called external research to make clear that there is a part, we are a part of Microsoft research, really dealing and um, uh, generating, promoting collaboration with uh, external institutes, external university, uh, attracting uh, uh, PhD students, students in general, internship coming here. I mean, you are part of the program, so the intellectual capital development the support that is part of this program. So you see our uh, mandate, our uh, mission is, uh, you know, work with the worldwide academic research community to uh, speed research, improve education, and foster innovation uh, as a result of all that. So we do that, uh, you know, we uh, do collaboration to somehow enable and pursue scientific breakthrough. Inspire emerging computer science scientists, that's basically what we're doing here with school like this one. And accelerate scientific exploration with computing just by making access to computing tools easier for, uh, you know, the average scientist as opposite to the scientists that already know how to do computing 
for their research. So uh, Microsoft Research uh, is a small part of Microsoft. We are less than 1,000 people in uh, almost 100,000 people uh, organization or uh, enterprise. And essentially, we operate out of, uh, well, there used to be six Microsoft Research Lab. Now there are seven because we recently uh, opened uh, in New York. And that doesn't appear yet in the map. But, you know, basically you see uh, Redmond, which was, of course, the first lab uh, to start, you know, 20 years ago, exactly 20 years ago. Then we have Silicon Valley. Then we have Boston, you know, next door to MIT. Now we have, uh, you know, close by we have New York. So four research labs in the United States, and then uh, the first research lab uh, outside the United States is this one that was started uh, uh, about 12 years ago, you know, 15 years ago actually, sorry, time goes fast. 15 years ago is this year, uh, here in Cambridge, and then Bangalore, and then Beijing. So altogether it's less than 1,000 researchers, a little bit less, so 1% of the total organization, but you know, we also have a pretty well established tradition of collaborating with the university research lab, etc. Because clearly, we can't do everything uh, inside inside this relatively small organization. So we have um, collaborative institute and centers. Is something I'm, I'm responsible for the activity in uh, in Europe, uh, in Greater Europe, including, of course, uh, the uh, Russian Federation. And, and Israel and other places. So, you know, so we have a bunch and those are with the kind of, you know, uh, yellow. So we, you know, I will see later, we have, uh, we have a few in, uh, in Europe, Middle East and Africa. And that I think is, is a particularly interesting experience that I want to share with you. So I can take this as an example. That is the, it was the one dot appearing in the northwest part of Europe in Spain. So in Barcelona, in collaboration with the University of Polytechnic of Barcelona, and please understand that when we start a joint institute, uh, the funding for the joint institute comes from Microsoft Research Connection, Microsoft Research at large, but also by the local funding agency. We don't go, you know, while a, you know, a research lab like this one in Cambridge is entirely funded by Microsoft Research, so it's entirely owned, started, operated by us. A joint institute, as the name suggests, is a joint effort. So we contribute to the budget, we contribute to the effort, we contribute to the research, but it's a jointly managed and funded entity. So that is essentially uh, uh, funded by the University Polytechnic of Catalonia, the Barcelona Supercomputer Center belong to, the, to UPC, to University of Polytechnic of Catalonia, and, and, uh, and Microsoft Research. So there we do a, a number of things, transactional memory, uh, which is something that we are kind of wrapping up. Also, transactional memory has been successfully used by their company like Intel, IBM, and so forth. Uh, we are not sure that that part of development is still that critical for Microsoft Research. So that is something we are wrapping up. But, you know, Tim Harris, who was in the lab, until a, a few weeks ago and now has moved to another position outside Microsoft, has been our primary contact. Another characteristic of the Joint Institute, they have an anchor, so they are collaborator in Microsoft Research, which are really prime investigator in, uh, in the activity. Language and time system, so we, do, uh, we develop architecture support to accelerate a number of uh, 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 activity. And again, that was a kind of a natural spin-off for the TM stuff. And then newer activity we started last year was well, low-power vector processor, which is potentially very, very important because, as you know, the limit now to build a larger computing infrastructure, larger computing machines and systems is the power. So really being able to develop architecture that are particularly low in power consumption is very critical for Microsoft life for everybody else. We have another institute in Paris, what well, near to Paris in Saclay, uh, in collaboration with INRIA. You probably know that INRIA is one of the largest and most successful computer science research organization publicly funded in, uh, in Europe. And, uh, and there we do essentially a fundamental computer science, software verification, formal methods, and, and so forth. And again, you know, the size of those institutes, that is typical, 25 postdoc and PhD students, so that is a little larger than Barcelona. Barcelona is maybe 20. 
And then we have another one in collaboration with the University of Trento. And that is more focused on applying uh, computer science to computational system biology. So there we really try to use the best of our technology and the best of, uh, of uh, University of Trento expertise to develop tools for the pharmaceutical industry, from the nutritional industry. Uh, we have recently signed agreement with uh, Novartis uh, to help them to develop new drugs and we Nestle to develop them to, uh, uh, um, you know, to develop new kind, you know, you probably have heard personalized medicine. So basically the idea is that, you know, you will be able to design drugs for a specific patient as opposite to generic drugs for everybody. The idea that we are developing with Nestle do the same for food. So, you know, you can develop uh, food which is particularly good for uh, the genetic profile of, uh, of one customer. So that is really, of course, you know, far in the future. But as you can imagine, tremendously important, you know, for, uh, for industry, but also, you know, for the, uh, for the good of, of the people. And then, you know, we have, uh, you know, just a few months ago, we started uh, a similar, a smaller uh, pilot in Turkey, which is a spin-off of the Barcelona uh, Institute. And there we try to apply formal method verification to transactional memory, which is a kind of a gap. I mean, there is no much about that. And transactional memory are uh, normally used in very, very large scale parallel processing system. So really having tools that apply apply uh, uh, support, uh, software verification in such a large multi-threaded code is, is, is definitely very important for us. And that is something that we started uh, last October. Uh, in Russia, we have been uh, running for the last several years uh, um, a number of activities with, uh, well, the Russians say MGU, I mean uh, MSU in English, the Moscow State University. And in particular, uh, over the last couple of years, concentrating on computer vision. Uh, our PIs here is Pushmeet and, and, and Karsten Rother here in Cambridge. And then uh, Moscow State University, Anton, Olga, and a number of other people involved. So uh, that is interesting because it's not yet reached the dimension of a joint institute. It might become a joint institute. Uh, of course, to become a joint institute, Moscow State University authorities that we need uh, to chip in resources so far has been essentially our uh, resources and, of course, in-kind uh, contribution from Moscow State University in, in terms of you know, paying salaries for the senior investigator. Uh, as part of this activity, we run a school similar to this one uh, last year. Uh, so probably uh, you, you will see some familiar faces there. Um, and like this school, uh, has become extremely popular. So we had more than 520 registration uh, from more than 70 cities from the Russian Federation. And eventually we selected 80 students. So the numbers are similar to here. And, you know, we uh, went through uh, one week of uh, intensive uh, uh, lectures and exercises on computer vision. As a spin-off, okay, let me stay uh, one second there. As a spin-off of that, I didn't put a slide on, uh, on this, but it will be covered, I think, tomorrow. We decide to uh, run uh, a student uh, competition uh, using our Kinet SDK, and uh, uh, we had a number of uh, um, projects developed and submitted, and then we have uh, a mix uh, Microsoft and external advisors uh, selection committee. Pushmeet was one of the members. And we eventually selected five winners. And the five winners got scholarship to be here. So can maybe I ask uh, somebody, OK. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, everybody's there. So they, they were the lucky one, or actually the people who work harder than, the, than, than some of the others. And I think you are going to present what you have done, uh, I think, tomorrow uh, sometime. Or on Thursday. Uh, no, tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow is. What day it is today? Today's Wednesday. Wednesday tomorrow. OK, so today's Wednesday. So I must be in Cambridge. OK. Uh, so tomorrow. Yeah, so it's tomorrow, I think, around 4 ish or something like that. You 
Okay, anyway, you, you will be able to know more about, about what we have done. And, you know, you can recognize maybe uh, Andrew Blake, uh, the guy that, you know, didn't, didn't get a, a, a T-shirt because he didn't work hard enough in the, in the school. So, you know, we, uh, we didn't give him a T-shirt. Uh, so he's the, actually the managing director uh, here in the lab and uh, one of our top senior scientists and, you know, well-famous computer vision specialist. Uh, PhD scholarship, I don't need to tell you much about it, you know, so we run that uh, on behalf of the organization. And, you know, we have other summer schools like this one, and I think, you know, the, the most important thing, I think, is the uh, getting people familiar with the go-kart. Did, did, you, did you get the go-kart outing? Okay, fine, yes. Everybody was happy, no one got hurt, hurt? no? Okay, good, good, yeah. Yeah, sometimes we had a little bit of casualties, but, you know, it happens. Okay, so, so that's basically all I wanted to say about uh, what we do in, uh, in, uh, in my organization. Uh, if there are more questions, you know, you now know after Simon's uh, Python Jones presentation, you know when to ask a question, when not to ask the question, etc. And uh, I, I don't, fall, I actually I don't agree with anything he said. I mean, I, I run presentation a completely different way. I don't prepare presentation normally. It's much better. You know, you get more uh, uh, spontaneous. So, you know, you ask questions as I go. If you don't ask questions, I don't care. We can discuss later on. You know, it's, a, it's, it's really a chat. It's not a formal presentation. So anyway, that's all what I have to say on what we do. We can discuss later if you are more interested, if you want to understand how to submit proposal to get support from us, how to start a joint institute, or anything else you like to discuss. I mean, you know... I like to discuss everything. I think, you know, during the coffee break, I was discussing the difference between Castilian and Catalan, the origin of the languages. You know, it's a very exciting subject. I like very much uh, languages. So, you know, whatever you want. Now, second thing, data. And somehow the transformation in science that the technology evolution over the last, specifically about, you know, 10 years, probably the last 10 years, uh, when really, you know, the moral laws start to uh, really impact on us at all possible level, not just in computing, but, you know, in, you know, data managing, data storage, data archive, uh, the, the, the technology they now allow to make, you know, sensors so cheap. I don't know, probably you have had something about gadget here and other stuff, but now, you know, you can find, you can, you know, buy with, you know, with few dollars sensors that are capable to generate a lot of data. So, you know, really, you know, this kind of, Explosion of data, data avalanche, you know, you probably heard all those, uh, all those numbers. So now, you know, we live and we're moving in, in, a, in an era where, you know, petabytes is common. I mean, you know, you want to store, you know, data um, as a backup. You know, we used to buy, you know, a you know, few hundred gigs. Now, you know, you buy by terabytes, you know, ter you know terabytes is as a form factor like that, and as you know, I mean, you know, it costs nothing. So petabytes now is nothing special. And uh, by 2020, which is almost there, uh, uh, according to MEC, uh, more than one-third of all digital information uh, that uh, is created, uh, you know, annually will either leave or pass to the, to the cloud. So, so, you know, not only we are uh, observing this gigantic amount of data production, but the data are going to be available to everybody. So the data that are going to be not any longer stored in one location, but, you know, stored in a virtual uh, storage, which everybody can access. And that is happening now. Now, when I say the data, you know, you know, you, you know I think it's very appropriate to start from the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, so that is, uh, is, uh, is a piece of the Atlas detector that uh, has been contributing and detecting the signals, uh, the evidence, the X. That is, uh, is the simulation, is a computer simulation of one HIG. And then, of course, all those data go to archives, and archives, of course, are either sitting in conventional co uh, computer centers, data center, and those data centers are virtualized and then become the cloud, as we discuss later. Eventually, you know, the, the science you do on the data becomes a piece of literature, which you access, and again, you access in a digital form, and is all available on the, on the, on the cloud eventually. And instruments, as I said, you know, those are sophisticated instruments, but now instruments become commodity. You put instruments everywhere, and you generate a gigantic amount of data. So, 
So that is, you see, digital information annually will grow by a factor of 44 between 2009 and 2020. I mean, so it's gigantic. And that is happening, we like it or not. So what is going to impact on, on science? I mean, uh, it's not only, you know, the data that, you know, the, the physics data that uh, uh, we produce with experiment, et cetera, but, you know, also the output, the output of science, it goes to, uh, to journal, goes to papers, and those are also, you know, up there in electronic form. So if you are a scientist, you are confronted with the scientific data that you collect, you want to access, but also to the, the kind of thing that you used to do in the library. You used to go to the library to read the latest paper, the, latest, the, data, the latest proceeding. Now you have everything online, so you are submerged by data uh, in a possible direction. So what is the impact? Well, I mean, you might have heard of the emergent, well, it's not an emergence any longer, you know, the forced research paradigm which, you know, uh, scientists like Jim Gray 10 years ago were anticipating is there. So we move from experimental science, which is the natural science that has been done from the, you know, from ever since, you know, since humankind started to observe nature, to theoretical science that, you know, basically, you know, started with, uh, well, actually with Galileo Galilei and eventually performed, you know, uh, improved by Newtons and everybody else. So basically try to reason on the observation, build models, and, uh, and eventually when the computer came, that could be accelerated because then you could really use computer to simulate phenomena that then you could then observe. And by comparing, you know, simulation with the observation, you could infer, you know, prove or disapprove the, the theory. And now we are basically moving from, uh, you know, theoretical, so, you know, decide on a theory, simulate in a computer, and then go for some observation to really look at the data. And, and the data is gigantic, and the data are, I think I have, a, yeah, the next slides. Uh, yeah, if you want to, to understand better about that, you know, this book is available on, on, the, on the web, so you can take it. And what I wanted to do, yeah. Um, so all those data is not just making science uh, more interesting, uh, more valid, but it's also changing the approach. I mean, the, the best example, I like to see this approach. When I was at university, I was very much involved in a machine translation, you know, automatic machine translation. And we're using a formal approach. We're, we're trying to take a language, define the syntax, define the grammar, you know, define the vocabulary, and basically write, you know, at that time I was using Prolog, so I was using logic programming, and we're basically defining rules by which, you know, you could take a phrase, decompose the phrase, analyze the phrase, and translate it in another language. That was a very complex process, which I think worked more or less. But we never managed to make a system of automatic translation that people could use. I mean, there were plenty of good examples, proof of evidence, but, you know, nobody could really use it. You know, the, the, the translation, I mean, you know, there were a lot of jokes, and particularly since I was mentioned Russian before, one of those systems, you know, the, the joke, I mean, maybe it's true, but, you know, for me it's more a joke. Uh, people were trying to build a system to translate uh, from uh, 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 English to Russian, and, you know, the, the phrase that was used, it was a phrase of the gospel. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with, uh, with the Bible, uh, well, actually with the gospel, uh, there is, you know, when Jesus Christ is, uh, is in the desert, is tempted by the devil, and, uh, and the devil, uh, uh, you know, basically uh, say, you know, tibi dabo, and you, you promise all the thing. And so and eventually there's a phrase that say, um, the, um, the spirit is strong, but uh, uh, the, the flesh is weak. And, uh, and the automatic translation in Russian translated... Um, and the spirit is strong, translated, the vodka was good, but the meat was not very well cooked. Okay, so, well, you know, you, you can guess, but, you know, it was not really usable. So now we change completely the approach. Now we have a lot of data, so we completely forgotten the formal approach, and we went statistic, machine learning statistic, okay? So basically, the machine learning approach is to use example. So you build system, you don't even need to know Russian or English. You just need to feed the system with a large amount of example, 
This is the English, this is the Russian, this is the Russian, this is the English. And the more you add, the more the system will learn. And also, you know, uh, the system that tend to be interactive. So if you are an expert, if you know both languages, you can actually help the system by uh, uh, correcting the, and improving the translation. So now you have automatic translation, which is not perfect, but I'm sure, you know, ev everybody of you is familiar, you know, you take Bing, you take uh, Google, you take whatever system, you go there and you get translation from any language to any other language. It's not perfect, but it's enough to understand what that paper is talking about. Often I do for abstract, I look at the abstract, maybe the abstract is in a language I'm not familiar with, I go for a translation, and you know, it's enough for me to see if I'm really interested in that paper. In that case, I can ask for a, for a better translation or not. So that has been done because now we can under petabyte of data. So that for me is a typical example of what we, what we mean when we say that we move to the four generation paradigm of science. So, uh, um, you know, to, to summarize that, as I mentioned, we have the literature, we have the derived recombined data and the raw data. So basically, the experiment input data there, you work on the data, and you eventually produce literature. So all this basically used to be done uh, partially in the computer, partially in the library. There was a lot of uh, you know, human interaction. You need to go to conference, you need to go to meeting. Now everything is up there on the, on the network. So, the cloud. So, how the cloud fit into that? So, first of all, I assume everybody's familiar with the cloud, but, you know, just in case, you know, just to make sure that we all speak about the same thing, because, you know, parentheses, uh, we are still in the early days for the cloud. I mean, the cloud is real, but it's still early days. So, when there's a new technology in the early days, there is also a lot of hype. You know, those uh, of you who remember, you know, the artificial intelligence and all those other things, there was a lot of high, which eventually made a lot of damages to, to, the, to the scientific domain. But anyway, so the cloud, we're still at the point in time where, you know, if you talk about cloud, it's easier to get funding. So many things which have nothing to do with the cloud, they, they now become cloud. I, you know, I was really very active promoting grid computing 10 years ago in the early 2000s. And I remember competing project to me that basically they had, uh, you know, two computers and, you know, a piece of wire. Oh, that is a grid. I said, well, that is not a grid. There are two computers connected by a wire. It's not a grid. But, you know, if you call it a grid, you, 10 years ago you could get money. Now, if you call it a grid now, you don't get any money. But if you had the same thing, two computers and a piece of string, oh, this is a cloud. Oh, cloud. Okay, then you can, here's the check, okay? So unfortunately, that is the way it goes. But eventually things settled down, and you know, there was a lot, a lot of good work done with Greek computing, and they stay, and there's a good foundation for cloud computing. Without all the work that many people, including myself, did on the Greek, we will not be able to do cloud computing today. But you know, just to say, so, so cloud computing as a model is nothing new. Still another reincarnation of distributed computing like grid or virtual cluster or meta computing or whatever we had in the past. So basically that as the idea that you know everything is virtualized. So data storage virtualized, computer resources are virtualized, everything is virtualized, including network access, everything is virtualized. So basically you build on demand your own computing infrastructure and you pay as you go, I mean, you pay for what you use and for as long as you use it. So it's a very flexible, very cost-effective model. And because it's all virtualized, in principle, it's unlimited. So for as long as the overall capacity can support your virtual infrastructure on the physical uh, resources, yeah, you can go. So you can ask, you know, you can have, you can start to develop your prototype on 100 cores, and then you can ask one million cores. Of course, you will be built accordingly. But if you can afford Amazon, Microsoft, you know, what have you, uh, they can deliver to you one million core uh, in the space of a few hours. So imagine building a one million core infrastructure yourself. It will take you months. So, is a, so the cloud infrastructure really is a framework where you can manage scalable, reliable, on-demand access to the application because, of course, you can also upload your application on the cloud. So, 
What is important to understand is this virtualization and the other thing is and that's where, I mean, there is a lot of rebranding and confusion. So, you know, an old grid, which is uh, maybe built by peer-to-peer -peer computing model with thousands of little clusters, etc., that for me is not the cloud. The cloud really relies on a relatively small number of very large, huge data and computing centers. Because there is where you get the economy of scale. I mean, that is a very old slide, you know, at least five years old. But you can see that the level, you know, if you take the basic component of any computing system, network to access and, you know, to uh, uh, communicate among computing nodes and data servers, the storage, the management, if you, if you see the typical cost in a, in a standalone conventional computer center in your department, in your university, and how that drops when you move to those huge data center, you know, that is the economy of scale. So that's the economy of scale that allow, you know, any uh, co compute, computational scientist to have access to this kind of infinite uh, uh, computing infrastructure. So, and that of course, you know, is, is going through a tremendous technical, uh, technical technological development. So, so only a few years ago, you know, a few years ago, we started with conventional computer center. So the integration was really at the level of rack. Then we moved to containers technology. And now we have a fully modular integrated uh, containers, which do not need any longer even a building. So you can just have your containers in a, in a, in a field and, uh, and have a, you know, and have a tremendous uh, cost-effective, scalable interaction. So if we take uh, Microsoft uh, Cloud, you know, you see that it's not a gigantic number of data center. You know, in Europe we have uh, Dublin and Amsterdam. Then I think now there are a bit more than these two. These were the two original US. I think now we have maybe four. And then we have a few there. So, you know, it's a relatively small number of huge data center with a gigantic network connectivity. Network connectivity in any distributed system is the bottleneck. If you don't have network connectivity, you do not have a distributed computer system. And that, you can see, I mean, you know, every time you try to play with any kind of cloud from your phone, etc., you see that at the end of the day, what really slow you down is the network. So, the major motivation are obvious. Uh, ten years ago, yes. So, uh, I ah, yeah. Mm. Is that recorded or? Yeah. Ah, okay. So I cannot be sure when I'm in Europe and I have some data on my cloud that it stays in the cloud in Europe. So it could be transferred uh, to America or to Asia. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Well, uh, it depends. Uh, there is a tremendous concern. Because, you know, the cloud may be different from the grid uh, has been uh, originated for business application. So, you know, in, you know during grid time, uh, uh, everybody was relaxed, you know, we were not concerned with much with security, privacy, etc. Cloud is different because cloud primary target is uh, commercial applications, business application. Now, what I'm, going, what I'm discussing now, how useful is for science, but clearly the concern of privacy data locality, uh, security are essential in the cloud. So, and again, so my answer is not specifically for Microsoft cloud offering. I think any cloud commercial providers offer the customer service level agreement. And as part of the service level agreement, you can define, for instance, that your data are not going to be transferred outside the national boundary or if you're in Europe, European boundary. So you can restrict your data and say, well, I, I sit in France or Germany, and I'm trusting this data to, say, Microsoft Cloud, Azure, but I don't want this data to go to the United States. So the data will only go to Amsterdam. Or you can say, I want my data to be in Amsterdam. I don't want the data to go to Dublin. So that you can actually specify when, uh, when you submit your job, when you create your virtual infrastructure. And I think any vendor does that because the, um, there are many things 
that are different from uh, uh, a, a legal point of view uh, in the United States, in Asia, in Europe. So clearly uh, uh, that is a very, very uh, uh, important concern. And for instance, you know, you know, you can, uh, you, you, you don't want maybe your data to even leave your national country because maybe if you generate data which have to do with maybe financial or medical, maybe by law you cannot move uh, uh, medical records outside even a boundary, you know, a very small boundary, maybe even a region. So there you need to restrict. Yeah, no, that is, is well understood. Now, is there a perfect solution? Well, who knows? I mean, as soon as you move the data on any network, you are exposed. So, you know, it's always a trade-off. You know, probably the perfect system is possible, but too expensive to afford. So it is really a trade-off. So if you want my advice, I'm not talking about Microsoft, I'm a great believer of the future of hybrid grid. So where basically you buy a container, you put the container in your company, in your research center, it's there, you can put actually physical security, and there you keep the data which are critical confidential. And then everything else which is not that critical, you push it to the cloud because it's so much cheaper. So I am a great believer that that's probably, for the next few years, the best solution. Now, not everybody supports hybrid grid. I mean, clearly Microsoft is looking into that, IBM, everybody else. But I'm a great believer that that's probably the best, uh, the best approach. And then, of course, you know, when all the, you know, all the countries will have agree on an international uh, protect, data protection act and everything, you know, when everything will be perfect, you know, 10 years, 20 years from now, fine. But for the time being, I think, you know, kind of uh, hybrid grid are probably the answer. So anyway, very valid question. Thank you. So yeah, the motivation, I think, you know, in a way we already discussed, you know, uh, uh, 10 years ago when we were basically pushing grids, you know, nobody discussed about environment, nobody were discussing about energy. Uh, I was not long ago, I mean, you know, a few months ago visiting a, a petaflop computer center, I'm not going to say where I was, and that was fantastic, and I said, yeah, but we are here in the middle of the big city, so how about the power? I mean, this, you know, it was, you know, it was like, you know, a football uh, field full with, uh, with racks of, uh, of computer. How much I have, you know, one hour altogether? Still left, okay. So, um, so I said, you know, that's fantastic, but I mean, how about the power? And this, the, the, you know, the, uh, the, um, the designer of the center, the director said, well, I don't care, I don't see the power. I mean, university pay for the power. I said, oh, okay, fine. Now, now I mean, that is, yeah, well, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it was a very rich, it's, it's, it's a very rich university. I mentioned the name of the university earlier in my talk, so, you know, yeah, it's, a, it's a, you know, interesting quiz. Um, but that is changing. I mean, uh, most of university around the world are using the full cost model. So if you develop a computer facility, you are going to see all the costs exposed, the people, the manpower, and the energy, the power. So now power is a big issue. I mentioned before, uh, we work on low power system, but again, the cloud, because of those huge data centers, you can have a tremendous reduction on the environmental impact because, you know, you can imagine having mean, those data centers up in the north, you know, there are data centers uh, being built in Europe in uh, using a, a, an abandoned or a dismissed, you know, paper mill uh, factory in north of Finland. There's very cold, so, you know, uh, cooling is not a big issue. And then there is a major hydroelectric a power, a big dam, so you get energy which is renewable, cheap, and no cooling problem. You just put the containers out in the, in the field and there is no cooling necessary. M now, the latest generation of containers, they really are capable to, um, uh, to operate in a normal, uh, no air conditioned environment. You know, that again is thanks to the development in technology. Now you can operate processor at 60 degrees Celsius. You know, you remember the days in which you were entering, you know, a, a computer room and it was, you know, freezing cold, 20, 20 degrees, you know, 25 already, you know, all, uh, all alarms going. Now we know we can operate processor, we can operate electronics uh, uh, substantially at the same level of reliability at 60, 65 degrees. So if you allow that, then you can actually use in a cold climate 
you know, just uh, you know, uh, natural temperature, no cooling. So you can imagine that if you do that, and because you know, the nectar in the meantime are become so powerful, you put all your data, you put all our computing in Iceland, you know, uh, up the north, and you have a much lower uh, impact because you need much, you don't need energy to cool the system, and you know, and you can use renewable energy. Also, because of the virtualization, you can provision. I mentioned before, I said one million core. Well, I mean that can be done in a, in a, at most a weeks. Uh, um, uh, software, few hours. You know, if you want to expand, you know, you just bring from your com containers. You know, few days time. You want to uh, uh, just uh, build uh, a large virtual infrastructure, you can do it in a few hours. And then if there is a disaster, you know, of course, there are concerns. If you put your data on the cloud, you don't know. Somebody could spy on those. Some uh, uh, foreign authority can allow, you know, can, can impose to disclose the data. On the other hand, if you put the data on the cloud, you don't put any restriction where the data go. You might have a copy in the United States, a copy in Asia, a copy in Europe. So in case of a major disaster, you know, you have at least one place where the data is still available, which again is a tremendous advantage. And again, you don't incur the cost of having all those backups uh, and other stuff. So anyway, so that I think is, uh, is what I wanted to say about the cloud to make sure that we all agree what the cloud is and why the cloud is a little bit changing the game in, uh, in uh, distributed computing. So why is that, yes? I'm a little bit confused about the legal things there. So if I put data on a cloud, mm -hmm. I guess I'm responsible for the fact that the content of this data is legal. But should it be legal according to country I live in or according to country the data center is? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah is, uh, that is the essence of the problem. I mean, so in Europe, the European Union has just recently uh, issued a data uh, privacy Act, which a number of application. Then there is, if you are specific interested to that, there is the activity of an European Union project I've been involved called uh, uh, Cloudscape. So if you look for Cloudscape, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about that. And essentially, yeah, the uh, let's say the common legislation, at least in Europe, say the people who generate the data are responsible for any uh, uh, legal issue about the data origin. So if you, if, you, if you steal data and you put it on the cloud, well, you are responsible. Now, uh, if uh, the provider of cloud services fail on maintaining the data, say lose the data. Now, at that point, it becomes interesting because say you have acquired data from a company X operating in um, France, but the data store in Germany. So who do you sue? I mean, the people who has delivered the service to you or the people who actually lost the data in Germany? So again, the current legislation in Europe say that the people that sign a contract with you is entirely responsible towards you. And it's part of what is called SLA, so service level agreement. So you, you produce data, say in France. You are responsible to be lawful according to France law. So according to French law, for instance, you cannot store pornography. If you store pornography and you're got caught, you are responsible. You go to jail, not company X that is storing the data. Now, company X put the data in Dublin and Dublin lost the data. According to European law, it's the French company who has sold the service to you, they're responsible. If then they move the data to Dublin, it's their business. Now, is this an international agree uh, legislation? Not yet. Uh, and again, on top of that, you have more complicated thing because, you know, U.S. law uh, is pretty straightforward, not very different, but there is the Patriot Act. So the Patriot Act say, oh, the security of the country is at stake, so the law do not apply any longer. I want this data. Oh, but this data belongs actually to, uh, to a company that is in Singapore. We don't care. You know, U.S., uh, you know, security is at stake. I want the data. So according to the U.S. Patriot Act, they can do that in the States. But of course, if you're data in Dublin, they cannot do that. So it's still a work in progress, but those are all valid concerns. So that's why, again, I go back to my previous answer. If the data are critical to you, buy a container, if you can afford, store it locally, keep it there, and move to the, to the virtual, to the virtual uh, computing infrastructure, also think that you can 
protecting the virtual machine, you put the virtual machine, the virtual machine runs, at the end of the execution, the virtual machine disappears, and in principle, you are safe. But right now, I mean, if I'm in France, mm -hmm. and, I put, um, they, and I put the data there, and the content, uh, content of the data is legal in France, mm -hmm. I'm okay, and I do not have to care if the company send the data or store the data somewhere yeah, where it's illegal. I, I, I assume, you know, since I mentioned pornography, by the way, it's still uh, think probably the most profitable business on the internet, uh, assume that maybe make the opposite, make the, you know, storing pornography data in France is, uh, is legal, but say it's not legal in Germany. Now, the data then get transferred to a data center in Germany where those data are illegal. Again, you are protected by the SLA. So in principle, you should be protected in Europe, but, you know, and I'm not a legal expert, so don't quote me, okay? That's is at the best of my knowledge, okay? I was not here. Uh, okay, so now what is important for science? Everything we've said is generic. It goes for business, goes for everything. But what is important for science? I mean, you know, everybody now has, you know, smartphones. Now smartphones are becoming a fantastic scientific instrument because, you know, you can take pictures, you can push data to the, to the cloud, I mean, there is standard interfaces, all easy. You know, think about medical application. You can be in an area where there is no medical support, no medical expertise. You know, you can have, you know, easy sensor. You know, you've seen gadgety, everything else. You can have something that major, you know, your, your uh, physical uh, data, um, bio data, and through a phone, you can upload it on, on the cloud, and there you can get medical expertise. So, so that is, you know, same phone as mine. So you can capture data in a very simple way, put everything on the cloud, and on the cloud you have a fantastic power, all the compute you need to have, and there you can then expose to the researcher, to the, to the user, you know, data in a very simple way and use, you know, you know the, f the familiar tools everybody use. You know, you can use Excel, you can use everything. So you can really do science in a very, very simple way, thanks to the power of the cloud and the power of virtualization. So, you know, simple tools to answer complex questions. So you can have sensor uh, in the ocean uh, collecting uh, environmental data, all put on the cloud, and there you can access with a spreadsheet. And, you know, anyone without being a computer scientist, but just a domain scientist, can work on those. You can have, uh, you can have genomic data. Genomic data, again, being inserted, you know, in a, in a spreadsheet, and there you can, you can work on genetic uh, in a distributed way, in a very simple way. So, so is the power of the, of the cloud virtualized resources combined with the ease of access of, uh, of conventional tools, which make, you know, cloud so relevant for science. So there is this slide where we try to capture the whole idea of this, you know, tremendous transformation that the cloud uh, uh, support. So today, you know, we have a pyramid where, you know, we have very experienced, high performance computing users, you know, you know, we are discussing at the beginning of my talk, you know, the, uh, the CERN, you know, the particle, the particle physicists, you know, when I started in particle physics, my first job was to take computers, throw everything away, and redesign everything. The, the binary loader, the operating system, the libraries, the runtime libraries, the compilers, because we wanted a very, you know, real-time oriented system. We couldn't buy one, we built one. So, you know, physicists know how to do high-performance computing. So are, uh, you know, many other disciplines. Uh, and this is really the top of the pyramid. The people who use supercomputers, supercluster, etc. Then you have everybody, you know, in the middle that, you know, they know how to use uh, pretty powerful, com, uh, com, you know, departmental class and so forth, big servers. And then you have everybody else, you know, the small team of few biologists, you know, in, a, in an institute somewhere without really access to computer expertise. So that is today. So what is, the, it's not a dream. What is happening now, very much thanks to the virtualization of the cloud, a move towards a unified research community where you have powerful, simple to use tools, the data, the data and the analysis tools are up in the cloud, so you don't need to maintain, you don't need to, uh, to, to apply patches or anything like that. Somebody 
does that for you. So you can build communities, you know, you can use a kind of social computing approach to, to science. And you can marshal the need resources on demand. You need more because you have a conference? Well, okay, let's uh, throw 10,000 core to your program. And then, you know, once the conference is over, you can release it. So that is very effective. And, and all that is going to accelerate discovery. So we move from a fragmented pyramid to a unified uh, global uh, uh, environment. So what we've done in this domain, in the few minutes that are left, I'm going to tell you, what, you know, how we try to prototype that. You know, two, three years ago, what I'm telling you now and now I think is uncontroversial. You know, we, we get down to a, a little implementation data. You know, is the data secure? How do you control the data? What are the legal issues? Everybody seems to me agree that, you know, cloud computing is where scientific computing is going. We like it or not. That's where technology is driving us. So two, three years ago, we, we already at those ideas, and we said, well, maybe we can prototype that. And maybe we can prototype that in a, in a context, not just in Microsoft, but, you know, Microsoft can join a bunch of uh, European partners in the context of a European Union project that we, we call Venus I mean, you know, there is a Greek important component in the consortium they propose Venus C. And, you know, you invent the acronym, and then you do reverse engineer from the acronym to, to do something that is relevant. So I, I don't even know what it stands for. But basically, the idea was, okay, uh, Neil Cruz, you know, she is the vice president of the European Commission, and she's also the European Commission commissioner uh, in charge of the digital agenda. So she's really in charge to transform the European economy in a digital economy by 2020. So that's why she is responsible for the next framework program, which is starting, is going to start in 2014, and it's called Horizon 2020 for a red reason. So between now and 2000, and, well, between, uh, let's say, two, three years ago and 2020, we had this challenge given to us by Nick Cruz, and here Nick Cruz appears at the, our uh, Microsoft Cloud Interpretive Center in Brussels, which opened in March 2011. So basically, he told us at that speech, you know, we have three pillars for cloud in Europe. The legal framework, and, you know, the question you ask really showed that that is an important pillar. The technical and commercial fundamental elements. Can commercial providers of computing technology provide us the right infrastructure to implement the digital agenda? And then, you know, the development of the cloud market by supporting pilot project or cloud deployment. So we said, okay, let's have a pilot project. So what we did is this Venus C. So we put together uh, a bank. Ignore. Uh, we put together a bunch of partners. And you see, you know, people that, uh, providing cloud infrastructure, which was essentially Microsoft with Azure, uh, KTH, who are in, uh, in uh, Stockholm, and they have big clusters, and the Barcelona Supercomputer Center, who, of course, have uh, large supercomputers. So we wanted to see how cloud could fit in an overall scenario where you have clusters, supercomputers, and clouds, commercial cloud, Azure. So we, we had, uh, um, you know, a bunch of other activity to disseminate, you know, the, uh, the result of the project, to, you know, cooperate on all those uh, issues, to do the training, and then do the scenario. So that's very, very much uh, the essence of the project. Take infrastructure providers, clusters, supercomputer, and, and clouds, put them together, build on top of that um, a development environment, which was developed by our colleague, actually by the guy who just called me now, you know, the, the, our colleagues in Haag and Germany, uh, who are a part of the Microsoft uh, ATLE, so uh, Advanced Technology uh, Lab Europe, and, um, and really build a number of user community around that and, and see if our theory that that are uh, the best approach to uh, modern computing is, uh, is correct. So you can see we started with seven user scenarios that go from structural analysis of building with the University of Valencia, building information management for green buildings in, in Trento, Italy. Uh, that is a, is, a, is a unit of the FAUD, you know, the UN agency that is responsible for food and agricultural. Uh, civil protection emergency in Greece bioinformatics, 
are again a Polytechnic of Valencia, Competition System Biology at our Joint Institute in Trento, and Drug Discovery University in Newcastle. So that were, if you like, a relatively uh, a significant uh, seven different areas where we deployed our application. And we had a pretty good success story, so now, you know, I'm reaching to the end, I'm not going to spend much time, but I mean, you know, uh, I already mentioned you know, the collaboratorio, a new startup is a very interesting way by which, by providing cloud computing, you can actually enable startup to really uh, develop a, a very valid business model and they've been, you know, basically uh, doing a workflow for a green building. Uh, the, the most probably uh, impressive demonstration of the power of the cloud was the system to help the fire protection and fire prediction in, in uh, Ireland or Lesbos in, in Greece because there again is the typical, you know, is the, is the killer application. You know, you need to have a tremendous amount of computing power during the summer when the risk of fire is very high, but during the winter you don't need the infrastructure because there is hardly any power. So having a, a kind of elastic virtual uh, infrastructure is perfect for that. So those were our big success story. Uh, if you go to venusc-c.eu, you, uh, you, you, know, you have a very nice website, you can get a lot of information. And again, I'll be, I'll be happy to entertain questions for the rest of the week. And then, with the experience of the first year, we had a very successful review last year, mid-life. Mid, mid we ran, uh, we solicited a new application and we got a bunch of new applications. So by now we have 27. And I think, you know, we demonstrated to Neil Cruz, to the European Union, you know, that our approach was a correct one, is very effective, and somehow is the demonstration of all what uh, we've been discussing in this last hour. So just to, uh, to draw a conclusion, that is the last slide, um, we believe that the, valid ad, the, valid, the value added uh, for science of uh, this new approach, you know, the, call it the four paradigm, call it uh, 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 cloud computing, is that by distributing, managing, curating data, that is much better served by a virtual, scalable, and elastic infrastructure. Elastic in the sense, you know, you expand it when you, when you need, when you don't need, you reduce it. Because of the economy of scale that we discuss, the energy cost, which is tremendous, the environmental impact that is much reduced, and so all those are better addressed by the current cloud computing technology. Virtualization of computing infrastructure can also support funding agency in developing new fund in developing new funding models. So rather than give you money to buy your own cluster, they can give you resources on the cloud, which are much more effective. When your project ends, they can remove and they can give the resources to somebody else. Now if they give you money to buy a cluster, at the end of the project, the cluster is lost. So that is what I capture in, say, moving from CAPEX, so capital uh, uh, investment, to OPEX, operational investment. So this eventually will lead to more science per taxpayer euro, or dollars, or pounds, whatever, and, uh, and, faster t and that is also much faster to deploy the conventional high-performance computing in emerging scientific and business community. So that's really the message I wanted to convey to you, and I'm happy now to entertain uh, any question you might have, or we can discuss offline. Now, uh, there are some resources, so I think the slides will going to be made available, so you can actually go to all those websites, and there is some references if you want to read a little bit more. Okay, done, thank you. Uh, thank you, Fabrizio. Uh, thank you very much for that. It's very interesting. We probably have time for a couple of quick questions. Um, I realize I'm standing between, uh, between you and coffee, so here we go. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask about load balancing. Uh, so basically, if you look at, for example, logging graphs or uh, utility graphs of some systems or networks, you can see sort of an oscillation between, you know, when, for example, Western world is awake and vice versa. Mm -hmm. uh, so how is this managed? So the system is higher capacity for that period, but not so high capacity for other periods. Well, I uh, don't know if I fully understand. I mean, actually, the, uh, the fact that uh, uh, there are different time zones and the infrastructure goes across many time zones allow this kind of optimization. So not only is a good uh, uh, kind of uh, automatic backup, because you have the copy of your data in different center, 
but you can also actually apply those tricks. So basically, you know, when, uh, let's say, United States is leaping, probably there are more resources there than uh, in Europe, so you can push your computational data. And again, because you are essentially running virtual machines, it's very easy, you know, which are self-contained. You can move your, you know, you can do load balancing across time zone. So, I mean, you know, so the answer to your question is, yeah, load balancing across time zone is done by everybody. And actually, that's not new because even in grid computing, we are doing that. In grid, you know, the, uh, we are discussing the large adrochron LIDAR, you know, CERN before, you know, the EGS at the beginning of my talk. Well, already there in a conventional grid, we were moving the loads of analyzed the LHC data from, for instance, the center of the Academy, Academy, Academia Sinica in Taiwan, you know, at a certain time of the day, and then move it to Europe. You know, basically it was, you know, following the, the sun cycle, okay? So moving from east to west with the sun, just to profit of that. You can also build in, in the cost. You know, you can make the cost in the States when it's nighttime cheaper than the cost uh, during daytime, and that somehow... Uh, uh, promote this kind of load balancing through time zone. Yeah, that is what I meant. Okay, well, thanks. Sorry, we have actually run out of time now. Um, we're really honoured to have Fabrizio to take time oh, to come um, and present my to honor. us today. Uh, and I'm sure they'll be around at some time for a couple of questions later on. But once again, can we thank Fabrizio? Thank you. Thank you.